well before most of us were born, prominent forester Jack Westerby summed up a large Australian timber congress by putting to the audience, this is an old congress, and I think you ought to do your best to make sure that the next one is not an old congress. Some of you are directors, some are managers. It will pay your firm better to have you spend a week on the golf course and send one of your youngsters instead. I'm happy to see that here tonight, we are definitely not an old Congress. This morning in the opening plenary, President Yudoyono acknowledged the strong youth present at this summit. Being recognized before all other stakeholders really shows how far we've come. Since Jack Westerby spoke those words almost over 40 years ago, young people have become increasingly involved in policy and research in the forests and landscape sector. In November 2013, the youth session at the Global Landscapes Forum in Poland put young people squarely on the map at this major international event. The stories that came out of this session showed how young people around the world are actively working to shape a sustainable future for our forests and landscapes. It clearly demonstrated that youth have a voice and that we want to be heard. However, we still see policy debates and decision-making processes occurring with little engagement of young people. We still see major summits taking place that failed to effectively integrate the voice of youth into discussions or outcomes. Today is different. Together, IFSA, the International Forestry Student Association, WIPAD, Young Professionals for Agricultural Development, and C4, have built on the success of the Global Landscape Forum Youth Session, and we have taken it to the next level. We wanted to come up with an exciting and dynamic new format that would harness the creativity and energy of everyone in this room. Today is not just about sharing success stories, but about fostering lively discussions and actionable outcomes from everyone here today. And this is no sidelines event, and it's not just another talk fest. We have come together to come up with new and innovative solutions and ideas to tackle some of the major issues facing our region's forests and landscapes. We are here to develop action-oriented recommendations about how to increase youth involvement in forest management and how to build the capacity and skills needed to engage in forest issues around Southeast Asia. These recommendations will feed directly into the high-level panel discussions, commitments, and conclusions of this summit. So I encourage all of you here to openly engage in the discussions tonight, share your ideas, share your opinions, ask questions, and make sure our youth voice comes through loud and clear. So tonight's session will be broken into three sections. We'll start by hearing from an inspiring young speaker who will share her experience working with and mobilizing youth to achieve positive policy change in Indonesia. We will then break for dinner, and then after that, we'll come back and break into assigned groups for our one-hour roundtable discussions. Each discussion topic is framed by one of the five key summit themes, that is forest governance, investing in landscapes for green returns, climate change, food and biodiversity, and communities and equitable development. After the discussions, we'll come back together for around half an hour to share our ideas, insights, and key recommendations. So without wasting any more of your time, I'd like to invite our opening speaker, Andita Utami, to the stage. All right, oops. 
Good evening, um, everyone. Thank you, Sarah, for the generous introduction. My name is Andita Firsali Utami, and I was born 22 years ago in um, Chianjur, a small town in uh, West Java. And before I start with my speech, I'd like to just point out how the word inspiring youth speaker really puts a lot of pressure on my shoulder right now. Um, and I, I, hoped, I hope the organizer didn't use the word inspiring, but I, I, I'll try my best. Um, so before, it kind of makes sound, okay. Before I start to, you know, trying to answer how youth can contribute in the policy making sector, I'd like to tell you guys a story. Um, it happens that this morning I drive to the Shangri-La Hotel and at the front gate, they always stop us, the, the security guys always stop us and then they got this bo like bomb sniffing dogs going around your um, car and then when they, finally let me go, the security guard uh, thanked me and saying, um, terima kasih, bu. He said, thank you, ma'am. And so if you're not familiar with bu, bu is actually a pronoun that they usually use for ladies that are probably older than 30 years old. Um, and my natural reaction to that was I actually felt a little uncomfortable. Um, and then, but then I asked myself, why did I feel uncomfortable at all? Was it because I want to be recognized as someone young, and why does it matter at all for me to, for me to be recognized as, as someone uh, young and not being called as bu? We all are probably familiar with the statistics. They always say that youth are important because we make up 43% of the entire globe, and this is a huge number, and thus we're important. But I'd like to, I, I, I then throughout the day, uh, throughout SBY's speech and then, you know, attending all the other sessions, I pondered why exactly um, are youth important? And I came down to a, a, a conclusion that, that includes several points. First of all, being, you know, the UN definition of youth is 15 to 24. Being in the age of 15 to 24 puts you into seeing uh, problems that are actually specific and different to those problems of your father's, grandmother's, um, uncle, or people beyond, beyond that age. And because we are driven by different problems, we happen to have a different and unique perspective in seeing how we should put forth solutions to the table. And second of all, youth, I think, are rule breakers. We don't care at all if you know, our parents put a curfew to us and ask us to get home before 10. We break the rules, and because we break the rules, uh, youth do not see norms as something that is so, you know, doctrinatedly cannot be uh, breached. We think that, okay, there is business as usual, but we always think that there is something beyond that. There is something beyond the curfew that my parents put on me. And third of all, it's good to be youth because we are very connected. We are, compared to, our, uh, to the previous generation, we are arguably more um, tech savvy. We're, we're all, we have um, Twitter accounts, we have Facebook accounts. You probably have heard some stories about how youth you know, raise a huge, huge awareness across the globe using the power of Twitter and Facebook. And fourth of all, and this is when I forget, you usually remember until three, um, fourth of all, is that youth are um, idealistic. We, some people think that we are naive or we are stupid because we sometimes come up with an idea that is so idealistic that people don't believe that that can be achieved. But I do think that that's actually the power of us, that we haven't really seen, you know, the bitter truth on the ground as much as, as the beyond youth saw. We still have that, you know, stupid idealism that can drive us to want to achieve bigger change. And last but not least, is that youth are still optimistic. And I think this is an important part of being youth, is that you still see that there is a future ahead of you, and you can be hopeful about how you can achieve a better future. Yes, our, the, the elder people, the adults, may speak about what they want to achieve in 2050 or beyond 2050, but it's actually us in our uh, young age, who's going to live in that world that we're currently talking about later in the future. 
Now you might argue that this is only all happening inside my head, um, that we're not actually you know, idealistic, optimistic, uh, we don't really break the rules and stuff, uh, but can I have my slide? No, I cannot, okay. Um, but my experience working uh, in the youth sector, uh, working with my friends, uh, showed that these, th these points are actually true. It's actually uh, represented on the ground. Uh, so my friends and I, back in 2009, we co-founded an organization called Indonesian Future Leaders. And through this organization, we have um, made several um, programs, one of which uh, that I would like to proudly say that I, I, uh, we started was the youth, uh, sorry, the national, sorry, the Youth Parliament Indonesia, or Parliament Muda Indonesia, which aims at, which actually dates back to the problem uh, of how we see that youth have been very much excluded in the policy making process. As much as we think that the government needs to include youth, we, uh, my friends and I, we think that it's also our task to actually organize ourselves and come up to them, sending them a recommendation that's actually powerful enough and work workable on the ground. Never mind. Um, Am I getting it? So we decided to roll out the uh, Youth Parliament Indonesia back in 2012. Yeah, so I am supposed to be showing this picture when I said that we break the rules, uh, but we passed that one already. Um, so yeah, no, before. Yeah, so this is this is uh, us, uh, the, the youth parliament members, being recepted at the parliament house. So what we did is we, uh, we did a road show to 11 cities and we reached out to 1,700 young people across Indonesia. Um, and we tried to ask them uh, to, to participate in, in, the, in the youth parliament Indonesia. And we managed to select 34 uh, young people sorry, youth parliament members from 34 provinces in Indonesia uh, through something that, that, that the adult people also do. So, so they registered and then they uh, put up their profiles online and they get elected online through you know, doing campaigns and then have people, their friends, vote for them. We gathered 15,000 votes within uh, a period of one month. Uh, and then we selected these 34 people uh, who, have the, who had the most vote from each of the province. So what they did is in each uh, of their respective provinces, they talked to their constituents, which are also youth, and they decided what are the most pressing, sorry, pressing issues that their province is facing. And then later, uh, when uh, each of these young uh, parliament member has their recommendation unique to each province, we invite them over to Jakarta and we isolated them in this, uh, in this place in Bekasi and then we asked them to formulate one national declaration of recommendation based on those uh, recommendations that they get from their friends in, in each of the provinces. And, um, and then later we, we contacted, we, we, we tried to push this recommendation forward and we are lucky enough to have first the Minister of y uh, Youth and Sport, second the Ministry of Educa National Education, and third of all uh, the, the parliament members themselves to listen to our recommendation and actually having the, 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 the opportunity to talk to them about our deepest concerns. And what I saw from this whole process is that all those points that I said in the beginning, how we are very idealistic, some people call us stupid, we break the rules, we go out of the box. These are represented in the recommendations that we send to the government. Now, the, the next question would be, how can we bring all this fresh and, and huge energy and optimism of youth to the forestry sector? Have we done that? Have we not done that? If we haven't, then how can we actually you know, incentivize youth to bring more of their ideas to the table of the forestry sector? Now, I would argue that in order to do this, we need to do both sides. So we need to go to the demand side and the supply side by, by you know, calling the government to actually open the doors for youth to be involved in the policymaking process. But at the same time, us as youth, we should challenge ourselves to come up with all, all, all the ideas or all the idealism that we want to achieve in the future. 
Now, um, to, to, to bring the story a little bit to, my, to myself, I, if you meet me a year ago, I was probably very much clueless about um, Indonesian forestry. My background was international relations, um, and at that time, I was doing an internship at the World Resources Institute, and my colleagues are all here. Thank you very much for being here. Um, and then later, uh, after, so my plan was actually to just do the internship and then boof, go away somewhere else. But during that three month of internship, I saw and feel very much challenged of how the problem of uh, forest governance and, and the whole land use issues in Indonesia are very complicatedly challenging and yet like beautiful to be solved. And I think these are the things that drive youth to actually be involved in something. They like challenges. So if, if we can just show how the forestry sector actually has a lot of problems that are challenging enough for youth to participate in and contribute, I believe that we can call, we can call on, um, more participation from them and, and, and I believe together youth can also um, help the government, the private sector, and all the civil society organizations to achieve better. Now, I, can, I then come to realize that it doesn't matter if people call me bu, if people thought that I'm older than my actual age, as long as, as I, I can still hold on to those five things, that I can still be idealistic, stupidly idealistic um, and probably optimistic and I, uh, I, I and, and, and all, all the other labels that youth have, let's all embrace it and use them in order to bring forth the better future that we want. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Andita. Um, I think your story really shows the power and ability of young people to organize themselves and actually access and engage with policy in these high-level decision-making processes. Some key points that stood out for me, um, like Andita, I find myself asking, how can we utilize our technological savviness, our optimism, our idealism, and our willingness to think outside the box to achieve this positive change we want to see. Hopefully everyone in this room, both the youth and the young at heart, can harness these unique qualities here tonight. Um, I'd now like to introduce our five young moderators who will be leading the group discussions this evening. Uh, but firstly, I'd like to make it clear that these moderators won't just, weren't just selected at random. In February, we put out the call on the Forest Asia website and across youth and young professional networks around the world for outstanding young moderators from or working within the region. We received 57 applications from around the world and then we began the tough process of selecting our moderators. We based our selection on their ideas and insights that they provided to key questions relating to the summit and this session. In the end, we narrowed it down to the five young moderators that are here today. So the first moderator, and I'll ask them to stand up, Yi Ying Te from Singapore, who will be leading the discussion on forest governance in the context of Hayes. Luke Pritchard from America, whose group will look at how youth can encourage green investment policies. Jamie Webb from Canada, who will be asking what skills and knowledge young people need to work on climate change projects in the future. Jan Joseph Dida from the Philippines, whose group will be looking at the role of trees outside forests for food security. And finally, Aristia Hadi Wanjaya from Indonesia, who will be identifying how we can work with communities to encourage sustainable and equitable forest development. For the past month, these moderators have been working with young scientist mentors from C4, as well as mentors from IFSA and WIPAD to get training in facilitation tools, communications, and topic development. Skills we hope that they will carry forward from this summit and continue to utilize after this session. 
So this process has also been about empowering these young professionals and also you as active participants to develop skills and engage in forestry issues in your countries and regions. Throughout April, each of these moderators also ran online discussions on the Forest Asia website to help them develop their topic brief. So this really is a youth session run by youth, designed by youth, for youth. In the e-discussions, we received over 120 comments from young people all over the world. Young people highlighted the power of youth and student networks to successfully advocate for investment and development change in their communities and universities. We heard from young people who are working with local governments and local communities to establish agroforestry systems, to conserve native forests and mangroves, for food security and climate change adaptation. And we heard that young people have the knowledge and communication skills to act as a bridge between communities and then governments and the private sector. But also that we need support to further develop skills for our future professional careers. These discussions show that young people are already actively engaged in forest management and conservation all the way from the grassroots level up to the national level. We have insightful ideas to bring to the table. We have questions and challenges to pose to governments, policymakers, the private sector and researchers, such as the people represented here at the summit. As President Yuriyono said, we are the generation that will inherit this earth. And our presence at the summit shows our dedication to safeguarding our forests and environment. So I look forward to seeing what that dedication can achieve here tonight. So now concludes the first part of this uh, session. We'll now take about a half an hour break for dinner. During the break, please make sure that you've checked your name on the participant list outside um, and that you know which group and table you're assigned to. And please make sure that at eight o'clock, you're seated in your correct table and group and ready to begin at eight. So I'd now like to invite you to make your way outside to the foyer where dinner will be served. Thank you. So if I could invite all the groups up to the front to sit in these chairs up here and I'll invite our young moderators to the stage. Time is up. <laughs> Round of applause for everyone. So everyone sitting around tables, if I could invite you to come up and take a seat at these chairs up the front. So welcome back everyone together. Um, and also I should say welcome back to our online audience who were watching the opening and also this closing part through our live stream. Um, I just wanted, first of all, everyone give yourself a round of applause. It's been so great watching all your energy and excitement over this last hour. It's been really great. So now it's time to hear the outcomes, the findings, and the key recommendations from each of your discussion sessions. So without wasting any more of your time, I'm going to hand it over to each of our young moderators who will have three minutes each to present their recommendations. First, we'll start with Yi Ying Te from the government, Governance Group. I don't know if I can summarize all of this in three, in three minutes because the group was really great in offering billions of recommendations. But so our group, the Governance Group, focused on the haze issue because it's the most, the most urgent issue that's facing the Southeast Asian region. And so we did this on three levels, the transboundary level, um, the national level, and on market certification schemes because private sector is also involved in governance. It's not just governments and not just policymakers. 
So on the transboundary level, we, we realized there were a lot of problems involved in transboundary governance because there's regional bureaucracy. For example, if the Indonesia was to ratify the 2002 ASEAN Agreement on Transboundary Haze Pollution, it would have to be ratified by the parliament. And so there's a lot of complexities involved in that. And in, in ASEAN, many different nations have different interests as well. So it, I think the transboundary governance was the hardest level to attack. So what the youth suggested was to rally governments and to, to really pressure for good governance. And they can do this through Twitter, through petitioning, and even a very cool idea of fasting from palm oil for as long as it takes to solve the problem. Another very good recommendation that the group suggests is for a youth ASEAN network to be formed and for a secretariat to be formed so that youth can be sent to ministerial meetings on the haze pollution issue and to really show that youth are concerned about this issue and to pressure governments into having sustained dialogue about this issue because we always see interest waning after a while, after the haze issue passes over. On the national level, um, we... Um, I think the most important issue was that there was a lack of transparency on information. And so um, the youth really wanted um, the N Indonesian government to publish documents on the division of power related to natural resources. So which government, is it the district level government or is it the national level government that is responsible for palm oil concessions? And they really want this information to be released to the public. They also want permit documents um, such as who has this palm oil concessions, who are these companies that these concessions are being issued to, and have they met all the criteria necessary um, for, the, for them to be granted these concessions. They also suggested a name and shaming of officials that are involved in corruption, and I think and they really suggested social media to promote this naming and shaming too. Um, one of the third recommendations for the national level is capacity building. Um, they think that research institutions can facilitate training for government officials and also smallholders can be educated about climate change because many smallholders don't realize that climate change is causing more drought conditions in the region and therefore fires are more likely to result. As a, and, and so they think that educating smallholders might um, enable them to prevent, to avoid um, setting the forest on fire. Another very cool idea on a national level is that um, we think that there, there should be an app or there should be a tool that empowers local youth to, um, to monitor the forest directly if, and if they see a forest fire to be able to publish it online and to send a quick text to a local government official and say that this is happening in this area and I want you to take action about it. And I think this is a really cool idea because Nowadays, social media is very often used by the urban youth, but not so much by the rural youth. And if you can, if you can find a way to empower the rural youth, that would be a great thing to do. Finally, on certification schemes, um, I think one of the greatest problems that the group brought up is that consumers don't really understand what certification means. A lot of consumers don't know what FSC means compared to RSPO. And they suggested that the youth start to campaign and raise awareness about this certification scheme so that more consumers would demand um, certifi certified products and producers would be more likely to supply these products as a result. So thank you very much. Thank you, Yi Ying. Um, I'd now like to invite Luke from the investment group to come to the podium and also to remind you to be as succinct um, and to the point as possible because we are running on a schedule here. So thank you, Luke. Okay, great. So I think just like Yi Ying, I'm not going to do my group any justice uh, with what I'm saying here. We had so many good ideas, and I also have terrible handwriting. So the first thing I'm going to do is go back over to our table and make sure that uh, I was really understanding what everyone was saying. But I think we had a, a lot of good discussions. The, the first topic that we were talking about were what are the green investment priorities for youth in the region. And the inevitable first question was, well, what are green investments? So we talked about different standards that are needed for green investments. Um, governance issues and different components of green investments such as environmental issues, human rights issues, and looked at some examples that have already come out that I think we largely think um, are not sufficient such as the Earth Charter and the Earthquater Initiative. 
So some of the priorities in terms of areas that were identified for Southeast Asia and for youth that are most important are green investments in fisheries, forestry, agriculture, industry, and the extractive industry. So these are all things that are very related to the conference that we're here um, today for in terms of a landscape approach. And these are um, issues that affect the entire landscape that are really of high priority for youth in the region. Um, another thing that was quite important was to include smallholders and local communities and any type of green investment schemes and particularly looking at microcredit type loans that will make sure that they're involved in these investments. Um, transparency also is a huge issue. It would be good if there was an independent assessment body to make sure we're not just involved in greenwashing when we're talking about green investments here. So moving on, um, the next thing we talked about is what type of platform is already existing or can we create and come out of today with to move forward to elevate the voice of youth with green investments. So we looked at some existing platforms. It's very hard to create a new platform. It's expensive. The coordination is difficult. One platform that everyone talked about was IFSA, the International Forestry Student Association. And they can really take, they have the expertise in the areas in terms of green investments and forestry. So they can take steps to kind of simplify their message and really amplify their message and use their network to organize to try to get invited to some of these organized forums um, and really provide policy input and policy advice to these green investment policies that are being developed. Um, another idea is that we really need ambassadors from larger organizations with more experience that are dedicated to getting youth involved. So if we can find NGOs or private companies that are willing um, to create a youth ambassador program that will mentor IFSA, for example, is something that we would really like to see. Um, also, a celebrity ambassador would be great, um, and there's also an organization here in Jakarta called Kofi that um, we could also build off as well. So there's different existing organizations that we'd like to see get more involved with the private sector and with the government to have stronger input, um, and we'd like to see maybe coming out of this something where we can officially get these organizations invited to existing forums that are going on. Finally, um, this, I have 30 seconds, so this is gonna be very fast. Concrete actions that we're gonna take moving forward. Awareness campaigns um, to promote green invest, investments and let people know why they're important. Um, finding expert leadership to help our efforts from other organizations and using social media to really get our voice out there, get our voice organized and elevated uh, so that we can have a stronger impact on green investment policies going forward. And that is just a fraction of some of the good ideas we had. So I'm sure we're going to have more coming out tomorrow. Thank you. So I'm presenting on behalf of the Climate Change Group. Um, this evening, we began a knowledge expedition to frame the support and skills required in order to maximize the potential contribution of youth to climate change solutions. I'm not going to present on our discussions, but I am going to present on our recommendations. So here are our recommendations. As youth attending the Forest Asia Summit, we commit to pursuing our own skill development. We are ready to continuously learn how to best contribute to addressing the challenge of climate change. We will work at all levels to make connections and build coalitions. We will carry out research and continue our own education. We will revive the youth organizations in the region and make them relevant, but we are asking for help. Youth require additional support from governments, universities, non-governmental organizations, international organizations, and the private sector. We ask these groups to commit to increased funding for skill training and education for youth of all ages. We ask to be better informed of and engaged in climate change conferences and decision making. And we ask you to provide seed funding for youth-driven climate change projects. Finally, we ask you to promote climate change jobs to build on the passion and the commitment that youth have. The foresight of today's leaders has started us on the transformation to a green economy. But it is youth who will inherit this new economy. It is youth who will be working on a daily basis to improve well-being and social equity in a manner that reduces environmental risks and ecological scarcities. Our discussions tonight on the skills we need to achieve this were fruitful, and we will take our work forward to see where it leads. Thank you.
So on the discussion that I chaired, well, we don't have chairs, we had a very fruitful discussion, okay? So I divided this into key points. So what the youth want in, uh, what the youth wants in terms of uh, solving the problems in, problems in food security is to adopt um, urban forestry and edible landscapes and agroforestry. In terms of youth as an organization, the, uh, the group proposed to recruit more members, publish their activities, and uh, use social media, and also do social entrepreneurship in order to promote uh, forest products as a source of uh, food, something like that. In terms of research, the youth can be more involved in promoting the forest as a source of food by um, looking for potential new products, food alternatives such as mash mushrooms and wildlife, small wildlife, and look for new ideas, something like that. And in terms of policy, the group um, recommended to push for um, the promotion of botanical gardens or the, establish the establishment of botanical gardens and also conduct petitions in terms of like uh, the pr food products and spreading information, something like that, and um, promote also bottle gardening or backyard gardening in their uh, urban areas, make it like uh, a, a, a habit. Okay, and I think that's, that's the key points. Thank you. Whose book is this? That's <laughs> so uh, I was a moderator of uh, Equitable Development Team, and according to our discussion, we have the three main important keys. The first one is how do we ensure the equitable benefits for forest communities. So according to our discussion, we want to promote uh, microeconomy supports like a community cooperative. We also want, want advocacy support from government and also uh, like an organization or private sectors to build the capacity of local people in order to, to take a good position of the local people in the contractual agreement. And then we also want the government or private sector to create or to make a very clear sharing benefits. The second point is ensuring forest protection. According to our discussion, we want to promote public-private partnership we also want to hear or to see a commitment of the private sectors about reforestation. We also promote a concept of land swapping. So we want the private sector to use a degraded land or bare land and then exchange to a forest area. And then the last main point is rule of, of youth. We want a platform, even if from government, from organization, or from private sectors, so we youth could develop our skills and also could like uh, apply our knowledge. So maybe it could be in terms of internship, volunteer programs, or job opportunities. That's it. So thank you to all of our moderators, but most of all, thank you to everyone here for participating, for contributing your ideas. As the moderators highlighted, that was only a snapshot of the one hour of discussions that we've had. But don't worry, we're not going to miss anything. Each of the moderators will be presenting um, a written report with their key findings to um, the coordination team. And I will be taking your recommendations to the closing plenary session tomorrow. And these will feed into the outcomes and recommendations from this summit. We're also going to continue this engagement of youth after Forest Asia. Some of you might be aware um, that there'll be another Global Landscapes Forum alongside COP20 this December in Lima, and we'll continue to build on the success of these youth sessions at the next GLF. So I encourage some of you, if you're interested in climate change negotiations, this landscapes approach, 
to start thinking about attending the next one in Lima. I hope through participating today that you've also learnt a lot, developed some new skills and challenged yourself. And I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to let you know about a number of other ways that you can continue to build your networks and skills throughout your study and early professional careers. And two networks that will help you do that are IFSA, the International Forestry Student Association, and I know there's quite a number of IFSA people in the audience, if you can wave. <laughs> and also WIPAD, Young Professionals for Agricultural Development. So for those of you who don't know IFSA, we're an international network connecting university level forestry students. Um, our membership is based in universities and we also connect them at a regional and national level. We work to enhance forestry education, uh, to provide a platform for engaging in policy processes like today and providing opportunities such as internships and mentoring through our professional partnerships. I'd now like to invite Marina from WIPAD to the stage just to talk a little bit about WIPAD. Hi everyone, uh, very briefly, so I, I work with WIPAD, the Young Professionals uh, Platform for Agricultural Development. Um, we are an international community of young professionals for young professionals for agricultural development. And basically we believe in the youth and we believe in the, the role they can take for agricultural development. So we share information, we connect people, uh, we uh, give opportunity for young professionals uh, to, um, to uh, participate to policy debates, to voice uh, their opinion. Um, we promote agriculture as well uh, through discussions on curricular development and also by promoting agriculture as a career path. And we also try to give more access to capacity building. This is in brief and you can ask, but okay, what are you doing here in this very forestry focused um, summit? Um, basically as a multi-stakeholder uh, platform, we really believe in creating linkages uh, between the different areas um, like agriculture and forestry. And we want to sensitize even more uh, the new generation in uh, working in collaboration because we believe that that's the way to go for sustainable uh, environments. So that's why uh, we've been working with C4 at the, for the youth session at the COP19. And we are here again with IFSA, and we hope that we carry on this way. And I take the opportunity to really thank Michelle for her work uh, through her communications um, work at C4, because she does push the uh, youth agenda the best she can. So thank you. And that's a good segue to invite Michelle to the stage to present our youth moderators with their certificates. Okay, I know everyone's tired and we're running over time, so I'll be really quick, but I think these guys did all a great job. Do you agree with me? Did everyone have a good discussion? So let's give them a round of applause and I'll invite them to come up and grab a certificate. I'll go Jamie first. Thanks, Jamie, who is a tireless worker in the climate change arena. Thanks, Jamie. Aristia. Aristia, who flew here all the way from the US and is enjoying being back home, I'm sure. Thanks, Aristia. Luke. Luke is with the Governor's Climate and Forests Fund, and I know is doing great work with them too, so thanks a lot for your participation, Luke. <laughs> Jen Joseph, who brought mangoes all the way from the Philippines. I'm sure everyone was happy about that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Jen Joseph. And Andita Utami, she's still here. Andita, our great, inspiring youth opening speaker. Watch out for this girl. She's going to go places. I wouldn't be surprised if she's the next president of Indonesia. <laughs> Yi Ying, Yi Ying, thank you very much for all your insight into the Singapore Transboundary Haze. I think Yi Ying did a great job. Thank you, Yi Ying. These people didn't just do this on their own though, they were supported by a number of mentors from C4 who are young at spirit and I think young in age too. So I'm going to invite them to come up um, because we really want to thank you for giving up the time to really mentor these young people and have fruitful discussions. So I'd like to invite Sophia who mentored Luke in the investment discussion. Sophia, are you still here? Oh, she's coming up the back there. While I wait for Sophia, 
I'll invite Cynthia, Cynthia, who mentored Aristia for the equitable development discussion. Annie Yang, who was also a mentor for Aristia in the equitable development discussion. Bayou Shantiko, are you here, Bayou? Governance discussion, thanks a lot, Bayou. And last but not least, Bimo Duisatrio, who mentored the climate change discussion. These are young scientists at C4 who have given up a lot of their spare time to really help with these. And also Samson, who couldn't be here, but we thank Samson in his absence. Thank you all very much for your help. We really appreciate it, and the young people do too. Okay, so thank you all for participating. I hope to see you at the next youth session at the Global Landscapes Forum. And until then, let's keep spreading this message and getting youth involved in these policy debates. Thank you.